This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. It's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And that's the oldie but goodie. It's uh, The Wall by Pink Floyd. And we have a very special show for you. It's about education, one of my favorite, favorite subjects. So let me ask you this question. When you were in school, were you an A student or a C student? You know, were you the star of the class or the flunky of the class? And if you weren't the A student, then did that mean you, you couldn't be successful? Is that, is that what it means to you? If you didn't go to a great school, you're never gonna be successful? What if you drop out? You know, what if you drop out like Steve Jobs and uh, Bill Gates? That means you've had it. Jack Ma, who was, the found, who was the founder of a little company called Alibaba, he just recently said, if you're 35 and you're not rich and successful, you'll never be successful. Of course, Jack Ma is a school teacher former school teacher who struck it rich. But naturally, they have this idea that if you're not successful in school, you'll never be successful in life. And my contention has always been, it almost damages you in school. You know, school damaged my brain, and my father was the head of education for the state of Hawaii, PhD. And I hated school. I mean, I sat there and getting pounded all the time for being stupid. So anyway, we have a very special show for those of you who are either A students or C students, but most importantly, if you still have children in school, what is school doing to your kid's brain? Any comments, Kim? Oh, this is, this is right up our alley. We have a very special guest today, and he's the author of the book Late Bloomers, which just came out in April of this year. Um, his name is Rich Carlgaard, and he is the publisher of Forbes magazine, and he has done extensive research on really what the school system is doing to kids. And what we've been saying for so long is that there's only about 20% of kids that actually learn the way the school system teaches. But now it's actually, as Rich is saying, it's actually been accelerated and everybody wants their kid to be, get the trophy and be the A student and succeed and get into college of, of their choice. And everybody's pushing for this achievement early in life. And Rich is saying, hey, maybe that's not the way. So all you losers like me in school, this is your program because if you're not successful yet, this is your last chance because you might be a late bloomer. Because if I waited, if I, if you judge me at 35, <laughs> there was not much hope, right, Kim? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, welcome to the program, Rich. Well, thanks for having me. That's quite a knowing laugh, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, like. Uh, it's one, of the, it's one of the questions, what's the FAQ, you know, frequently asked question. What is your biggest failure? What is your biggest failure, you know? And these people are terrified of failure. And I said, well, I don't think I've made my biggest failure yet. I'm going to make another one coming up, you know? And, they get, and, it's, it's, and for me, it's always been how you address the subject called failure. And I, I failed out of school. I failed in business. I failed this way. But I just kept going, and that's the only difference. Well, look at look at Rich Dad Poor Dad. You wrote that when you were fifty years old. Yeah, that says something right there. <laughs> so, Rich, what your book is called "Late Bloomers: The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement." What what drove you to to write this book? Well, I've always thought of myself as a late bloomer. At age twenty five, despite having a degree from a good university. I was watching all of my roommates going off and doing extraordinary things, beginning high-powered legal careers, high-powered engineering careers. Uh, one was uh, getting his Ph.D. In, in divinity at a full theological seminary. At age 25, I was capable of holding a job no greater than security guard, temp typist, and dishwasher. <laughs> and, and, you, and, that, whether, that, and that pretty good school was called Stanford, wasn't it? Yes, but it was Jeez. a lot easier to get into in the 1970s than it is now. They took about 25% of applicants. Moreover, they, they really looked for a geographic mix within the United States. So if you were from, if you were from uh, North Dakota, as I was, it was easier to get into. And then I was a junior college transfer who was a decent runner, and I filled a spot on the cross-country and track teams, not as a scholarship athlete, but as a sort of a placeholder. <laughs> and all of that uh, allowed me to get in. Now, I 
but I just goofed off. I mean, I goofed off because I couldn't do the, the work. When my roommate, who went off to be a very successful lawyer in Silicon Valley, and I would walk to the library, he'd sit down and study for three hours straight. And after about 15 minutes of fidgeting, I would walk off into the library and lead, read back issues of Sports Illustrated. <laughs> well, that's 15 minutes longer than I could handle. <laughs> so, so you're and, saying uh, that but, just be, you know, success in school and all that is not a precursor for success in life. Well, I, I have never believed so, but here in Silicon Valley where I live, and I think you'd find it true in all of the uh, high-performance affluent cities around the country like Seattle and New York and Boston and, and many others, there is this belief that kids need to get on the track for success at a very early age. In New York City, there are preschools that charge $50,000 a year for three-year-olds to immerse them in language, participate in a multi-building campus, et cetera, et cetera. And the not-so-subtle message to parents is that if you don't do this now, um, you'll only have yourselves to blame 15 years later when your kid doesn't get into Harvard. At three years <laughs> old. Wow. Well, I, yeah, I, went to, because... I went to a school where I had three, three of my classmates go to Stanford. And I didn't even know what Stanford was. <laughs> That's how backward I was, you know, but they were all obsessed with it and then went to Dartmouth and Yale. And that was my class, and it was just well. One of my one of my classmates was a fellow Hawaiian guy, Kawasaki, and he did oh, pretty yeah. well too. We know guy. Yeah, he was yeah, a guy yeah. very well. Yes, yes. He, he was not a spectacular student either, but he was a really <laughs> good organizer of intramural sports and and things like that. But uh, you know, his father. I really think, that I, I, really think I really think what's going on here, uh, Robert and Kim, is that if you look at the U.S. economy over the last 20 years, but particularly in the last five to 10, the two most reliable sources for creating very rapid wealth happen to be in Silicon Valley kind of technology. It isn't limited to Silicon Valley, of course. It's around the world and in many cities and in high finance of the Wall Street venture capital and hedge fund source. And when you, when you really delve into those, you see that Silicon Valley, which used to be hospitable for people like Steve Jobs, who dropped out of Reed College, now has become this almost exclusive club where if you didn't go to MIT, Stanford, Harvard Business School, a handful of schools like that, you're really behind the curve. You're going to have a hard time getting venture capital funding if it's your first venture, hard time getting that first job at Google or Facebook unless you have some other extraordinary thing that you can show them. And the same is true of Wall Street hedge funds, venture capital firms. They're clubs um, populated mainly by people who went to a handful of schools. I think, that, I think that's crept back into the culture and created this kind of panic that if we aren't getting our kids on a fast track at age three and they aren't demonstrating that they're really good at standardized tests or they're really good at getting A pluses, you know, that somehow, they're, uh, somehow they'll never get a job at Google or Kleiner Perkins or or Goldman Sachs, or someplace like that. Now, it, it's a very narrow view, but it's a view that's kind of swept everybody else up. So you're, say, you're saying, though, this fast track actually can be damaging kids? Well, it is. Um, there, there are rising rates of depression, uh, anxiety, suicide. Two public high schools in Palo Alto in the 2014-2015 year had six suicides and more, more than 40 treatments for suicidal thoughts. I interviewed Carol Dweck, yes. um, who teaches freshman psychology at Stanford. She wrote a best-selling book called Mindset. Love Wonderful that book. book. Yes, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Satya Nadella at Microsoft recommends it to everybody. It's that good a book. And I said, um, congratulations on the success of your book. And she said, thank you. It succeeded where I didn't think it would succeed, which is in business. But it's not succeeded where I hoped it would succeed, which is in the education industry. And I said, well, do tell. And then she leaned forward. You know, she's a tiny woman. She's, I don't even know if she's five feet tall. And she leans forward, and she says, the kids I see at Stanford today are brittle, exhausted, and they don't want to mar their perfect records. So we're not creating people. We're not. This system isn't producing people with a joy for learning, with a bounce in their step, with an idea of going out and experimenting and failing and experimenting and failing. It's producing people that, because they had straight A's and, and near-perfect SAT scores, they don't want to do anything that's going to expose them. That's correct. There's another book out. It's called Tailspin. I don't know the author's name, 
but he was Yale and then Yale Law, and he says that one of the reasons we have such huge, Stephen Brill, right, Stephen Brill, Tailspin, fantastic book. He says one of the reasons we have such a horrible economy is because of what our top schools are pumping out. People who all they do is care about themselves and they create these CDSs, credit default swaps and derivatives that damage everybody. And then there's that woman who wrote about the Fed. She was uh, some D. Martini Booth. She does. She has two master's degrees and she says the Fed, if you didn't have a PhD from Harvard or MIT, you didn't count. And she said during the crash, when the, with all the markets were crashing, these thousand economists at the Fed had no idea the market was crashing. And she says, I cannot believe people are so highly educated, but they're so unaware of the world. And I think that's, yeah, what, well, I, that's what we're saying. I think, that, I think that's absolutely true, because what the SAT does is measure sort of narrow, rapid algorithmic giftedness. And in my book, Late Bloomers, I go through the history of IQ testing in the United States and how it led directly to the SAT test. A man named Carl Brigham at Princeton developed the SAT in 1926, but it was really an extended version of uh, Lewis Terman's Stanford Binet IQ test, which is the U.S. adaptation of the French test. But the French developer uh, Binet believed that the, you know the IQ test could be a very useful diagnostic tool that might help us uh, with uh, create remedial programs for children who are struggling in school. Never did he say or imply that it would predict lifetime outcomes. Lewis Terman believed it would predict lifetime outcomes. In fact, he launched a, a, a longitudinal study, the Stanford Study for Giftedness, and it turned out <laughs> to be utterly... Yeah, the, these early gifted test takers reverted to the mean. They weren't any better or any worse than all of society. But also, and you one say- more thing, there was a poisonous seed in all of that. All of these uh, U.S. early IQ testers of the of and developers of the early 20th century were part of the eugenics movement. I mean, it's just that that alone should tell you how biased their thinking was as they constructed these tests. What's eugenics? Well, eugenics is the belief that people of certain races and cultures and ethnicities are superior to others. Well, all and Asians are pro- superior, but I, I bring the <laughs> well. curve. I bring the curve down there. That was the problem, you know. I mean, everybody everybody looks at me like I must be Asian. I must be smart, but I bring the curve down wherever I go. <laughs> well, that, that when it was back when it was developed, it was you know the belief that people of Northern European heritage were were brilliant and as you work your way to the equator iqs dropped and and uh, carl brigham had profound regrets about his test by the way he died in the 1930s and he said we've committed a grave a grave error but yep. anyway this is this is the dilemma that we've gotten into and when you're narrow, uh, when you're overrating narrow uh rapid algorithmic skills your what you're missing is all the other great skills that make people tremendously creative people yes. throughout their lives and many of them Tremendously gifted entrepreneurs. Once again, this is Robert Kiyosaki. We're speaking to Rich Carlgard. His book is Late Bloomers. Fabulous, fabulous book. Very simple, easy to read. And it's very important for two for two sets of people. Number one is, or actually three. Number one is if you have children, kids in school, he's going to talk about how you protect your kid from the insanity of the academic system. Number two, if you're an A student and you're still a screw-up, I think Rich can help you there. And if you're like me, a screw up until age 50, there's still hope. Basically, that's what there is, okay? So those are the three types of people we'll be talking to. It's a very important book. It's Late Bloomers. But I know from my own personal experience, you were talking about you get near the, near the equator. I never studied in school. And I could pass every test. Didn't mean I was smart. I just understood the test. But there are a lot of what you call darker-skinned kids who just didn't have that. They didn't know how to just understand the test. And I sit, I saw this one girl named Martha. You know, she was a great hula dancer. She's a Hawaiian girl. Man, she got crushed in school. She just got crushed. And I sat there, and I was watching this. It was a white teacher just crush her. 
You know, you'll never amount to anything. You know, no, 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 I'm going. That's criminal. So Martha did very well. She runs a hula studio now. <laughs> She's doing quite well in Hawaii. But that's kind of what you're saying is yeah. there's all these other skills and talents and creativity that are just kind of by the wayside. There's no more trade schools, none of that. Right, Rich? It's, it's like, oh, it's, yeah. It's well, all... I think the loss, of, the loss of trade schools in public schools in the United States, only one out of 20 public schools teaches skilled trades or what we used to call shop class in home ec. That was my favorite class. <laughs> shop, wood shop. I was an A student in wood shop. There you go. <laughs> yes. Well, there you go. I mean, I think Mike Rowe, the dirty jobs Mike Rowe is absolutely right about this and should be elevated to a cabinet position really for bringing these issues up because these jobs have changed. They intersect with technology and, uh, and they provide great incomes for people. And by the way, People who don't, um, people who go into a skilled trades can always go back to college later. Who Amen. wouldn't want somebody? Who wouldn't want somebody who'd been an electrician or a welder, then going back and getting a civil engineering degree? What employer wouldn't want somebody with that broad, Amen. That broad day training? Hey, Rich, we're gonna, we're, and, we're gonna... and and I will tell you something else. Every uh, a week after Christmas, my wife and I uh, traditionally go down to Indian Wells near Palm Springs, California, right. and we rent a condo, and we rent it from a plumber. Yep. Well, the plumber, of course, is a guy who built a plumbing firm. Right. So there you can go. always take those skilled trades and build firms out of them, too. And he probably X- read my book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he invests in real estate. <laughs> That's what he's doing. I anyway. he did, well, he did. He owns... He owns places in Newport Beach. And yeah. Yeah. All the, yeah, it's like the all it's the like the uh, it's like the window washer that Robert met in New York City, who now has his own window washing company and owns a lot of rent, rental properties. Yeah, in New York. Exactly City. what you're saying. In New York yep. City. Yeah. Yep. And I'm going, holy moly! He says he thank you for writing the book. I said I better read my own book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Rich, oh, we'll, know, we'll, the, be, the, we'll the, be right I'll back. The, um, among the richest of my friends is somebody who is a grocer. Yep. And but he started investing in apartments and now he has several hundred of them. Yep. 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 Once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki. Our guest today is Rich Carl Carlgard. And his his book is called Late Bloomers. It's for those of you who have kids in school, for those of you who are A students and still not not doing well. And for you old guys like me who are still hoping the ship comes in. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Day Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Today we have a very special guest, Rich Carlgard. But before I get to Rich, you know, this is especially for those who was with students still in school or you're struggling financially and you're over 35 or you're an old guy and you still haven't made it. It's going to be a very important program for you. Once again, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android. And all of our pro- programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because one of the best ways to learn is via repetition. Like you don't learn to play golf or taking one golf lesson. So you can listen to this program again, and then especially if you have friends, family, or business associates, because this is a very, very important program. The, the, the book is called Late Bloomers, and uh, listen to this again with friends, family, and business associates on richdadradio.com. And Rich Carlgaard is author of Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement, also The Soft Edge, Where Great Companies Find Lasting Success, and Team Genius, the new science of high-performing organizations, and his we- his website is richcarlgard.com. Last name is K-A-R-L-G-A-A-R-D. So, any comments, Kim? No, I think this is fascinating. Um, so, let's get back to Rich. So, Rich, you're talking about, you know, how can you talk about how school? I have a lot of friends with school says damages people's brains. I knew it would damage mine. It was called extreme boredom. So what do you have to say about that? <laughs> well, I think that's absolutely true. You know, one of the scandals in the United States, and I mean it is a scandal of, uh, of huge proportions, is our overdiagnosis of ADHD, and then even worse, uh, how we prescribe Ritalin and other drugs like that to people who were probably falsely diagnosed as having ADHD. We, you, you actually, 94? you actually, you actually say that ninety for ninety five percent of the drug prescriptions for ADHD is given in the United States. Ninety five percent. Yeah, yeah, and that comes from uh, Dr. Leonard Sachs, who wrote a couple of great books, "Boys Adrift" wow. and "Girls on the Edge." Wow, it's an absolute scandal that just you know let's just take boys because more more of the diagnosis are boys. Boys have always been boys read Mark Twain to understand how boys will always be boys. 
And uh, because they can't sit in school, suddenly ha- they're diagnosed with a problem. It's like we've made a <laughs> yeah. pathology out of a kid's inability to get 800 on their SAT. Yeah. Well, you, uh, that was me. I just couldn't even sit in that classroom. So, but my, you say, but you say, you, you mentioned the col- you know, the, the the scandal of the college admission scandal. And is that that all feeds into this obsession with the early achievers, right? Got to get into the right college, and I'm oh, going to yeah. pay I, for it. To I, go ahead. I think that's just the extreme manifestation of a, of a certain logic that's at work. And I'm sure these extremely affluent parents who bribed admissions directors or bribed country clubs, sports coaches to get their kids into school pro- had no idea that they had crossed the line and were committing committing a felony. Well, but, imagine so we that, but they develop. were trying to, they, they were bribing kids into USC, a state school. I mean, my God, I could see bribing yeah, somebody well, into Stanford. <laughs> well, you, you, yeah, no, USC is private, and USC has really come up in the world. Oh, since, it is? Let's say the OJ, yeah, since the O.J. Simpson days, and it's it really has the best alumni network in all of Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Very valuable, very valuable That's where that. Nixon's guys went, Haldeman and all those yeah, guys. Yeah, that's right. That's why, that's why I never liked USC <laughs> after that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, guys, smart guys with no morals. So you also... You yeah, t- go ahead. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk in your book, Rich, about the, the neuroscience or the brain research that, you, that goes along with your um, analysis. What, what is, the, there, what is there, brain research telling us? There are quick, three quick things that you should know about some of this fascinating brain research. One is what car rental companies already perceive in the way they charge people under 25 higher rates. The prefrontal cortex in our brain is not fully developed on average till 25. And there's some neuroscientists that believe that with each generation, it's being extended another 18 months or so. And that's sort of where our executive functioning, our ability to look ahead, uh, see consequences from actions really result. Number two, that uh, this is a really important one. 2015, a study led by Harvard and MIT in conjunction with Massachusetts General Hospital asked a simple question, at what age do we cognitively peak? And the answer is very intriguing, very complex, and very hopeful, because the answer is what cognitive abilities are you talking about? There are certain things where we peak early, rapid cognitive processing speed, working memory, the things that might make you a high-frequency trader on Wall Street or a software programmer in Silicon Valley. But all of those uh, brain functions that support executive functioning, leadership, communication skills, uh, all begin to flower in our 30s, 40s, and 50s. The average Mm -hmm. age of entrepreneurship in the United States, believe it or not, is 47. That's the median age. People think it's much younger, but it makes sense when you look at the brain research. And then finally... Um, The the neural networks that connect the left and right hemispheres of our brain keep developing throughout our healthy lives as long as we stay healthy and as long as we stay mentally engaged. And we're capable of tremendous insights uh, into our 60s, 70s, and beyond. So there's hope for Robert here. Oh, thank God. Thank God. He just made his day. (laughs) Hey, Rich, let's let's, let's, let's keep our promise. Let's say uh, I'm a parent with a, a kid, boy or girl, who is just... Hate school. What would you say? I would say listen to that kid and and really get to know that kid and don't outsource your parenting responsibilities to the professionals, to the educators, to the counselors, to the psychologists. Amen. I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine that I went to college with is a clinical psychologist with a family practice, and it, and it's often because of a boy who's not paying attention to school that brings the family in. And so he gives the example that he's heard countless times, but this is sort of representative. The family brings in a kid who's checked out of school. He's like a sophomore in high school, and the family's very worried about it. But the family is, is high pressure. They're white collar. They're very aspirational. They believe that all kids should go to college. And they thought their kid was, was getting into trouble. The friends he's hanging around with, were the, they didn't look like the friends that, that you're supposed to have in Pasadena. And all it turned out was the kid had developed a love of cars, and he was so embarrassed uh, to tell his parents that he wanted to be a car mechanic that, uh, that he just checked out and they had no conversation at all. So the parents thought he was screwing up, and in fact, he was just expressing a love um, with his new friends that he was afraid to share with his parents. Yep, very good. That was, that's my kid brother. He's yeah. 
My brother John is a genius when it comes to cars, but my mom my mom wanted him to be a dentist. <laughs> so, but, but yeah. and as you say in your book, Rich, you know, and we've said this many times, as kids go into school and then they're told they're stupid because they don't fit the they don't fit the system, so they're told they're stupid and then they believe it, and then it's downhill from there. Yeah, and there used to be more ways to catch kids like that. You know, it's hard to get into the military today. You know, J.D. Vance wrote a bestseller in 2016, right. Hillbilly Elegy, and he was a poor kid from a very dysfunctional family. The only functional one at all was his grandmother, and he went off to the Marines. He got uh, male role models for the first time, and he came back, went through Ohio State in two and a half years while holding two jobs. And so, you know, but the, the, what I was kind of struck by that book that it, 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 they used to be more commonplace. You know, it used to be more commonplace. The society had more ways to catch the kid who had mentally checked out. He wasn't, didn't really do well in school and, and then, then went to the military or something like that, got a job, got confidence, and began to bloom. Yep. That was my story. I was in the Marine Corps, too. It shaped up. Hey, uh, so what wow. about somebody, let's say they're 45 and they're still the born loser? What do you say to them? Well, I think that 45-year-old has to look at, you know, really do a self-examination about where, why they might not be achieving the things that they want to achieve. All of this assumes, of course, Robert, that that person really does want to achieve and make a mark and fulfill certain financial expectations and so on, and it's not an overgrown Big Lebowski or something. But, uh, you know, you have to look at whether you're in the right place. You have to look at whether you're hanging out with the right set of people. You have to look at whether you've developed mental habits that are undermining you. You have to look at, you know, have you let self-doubt creep into your self-worth and, and tow you down? So there are, I think there are, there are some rigorous self-examination, and I'm a big advocate of joining peer groups. And peer groups, you know, most of them are free. I mean, the, the, the granddaddy of peer groups is probably Toastmasters. Uh, all the 12-step groups are peer groups. But you can go to your church, one of the good reasons to join a large church is you can you have peer groups to talk about your career or parenting challenges. It's good to be around people who are facing the same challenge as you, but then to hear from people who have overcome the same challenges you're facing. So the, the, the last question is, let's say you're an old guy like me, you know, like when Jack Ma was saying if you're over 35, you haven't made it, you're never going to make it. And I talked about Colonel Sanders, was, it was after he was retired and uh, uh, the highway went over his chicken shop that he created Colonel Sanders. And then he became a success at 70. So what do you say to older people? Well, I would say to older people, lean into the person you're becoming. Don't go back and try to reclaim what you thought you missed. Because when you go back to the brain research, you see that you're becoming someone new all the time. Elkanen Goldberg is a 72-year-old neuroscientist at NYU, and he noticed in his late 60s that his intuitions turned, about, turned out to be as accurate as his rigorous logical processes. He would come to the same conclusion much faster with his intuitions. And he did a bunch of research around that. So you have gifts in your 60s, 70s, and even 80s that you didn't have before, including really well-informed intuitions. So follow your intuitions. And and for parents, I, I love that. Follow your intuition. That's I like that a That's lot. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, no, so what? Not a, something maybe not something you would tell a teenager. Right? Yeah. True. <laughs> true. 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 They're not. They're not there yet. But for parents, okay. So let's say you're a parent and you're pushing your kid and you want them to be that A student. You want them to get into Harvard and their kid is just not making it. And now they feel like they're failures. What do you say to those parents? Well, we've got we've got some neighbors who just raised their boy excellently. He was a B student and a part of the world in Silicon Valley near Stanford where the expectations are A's. But, but you know, one, but the dad was, came from a blue-collar family in Philadelphia. He's now, a, you know, a chief operating officer at a publicly traded company. Um, so, but a, kid, a, a father with common sense. And they decided they would encourage their kid to be well-rounded. So in addition to B's, B's are good enough, he said. Um, the kid went to Boy Scouts, became an Eagle Scout. He launched a T-shirt business. He didn't get into Stanford or Cal. He's going off to the University of Colorado, and they couldn't be happier for him. They have raised a really good boy. And is there any proof that going to a great school like Stanford or Harvard or MIT is a guarantee or precursor of success? Well, you you can't deny the advantage of being in that network in a part of the world that parts of the world like Wall Street or Silicon Valley 
that value those sorts of things. Pedigrees. But that's the that's that's where the value the pedigree. That's where the value stops. Um, Google, which is founded by two Stanford grad students who scored perfect math SAT scores, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, had the belief. Jeff Bezos had the belief too. Whatever you scored on your math SAT, you know, that's something we, the company, want to know when we're interviewing you. And yet when they tested that, when Google tested that to see whether you had an elite degree and what your SAT scores were, the correlation was very weak about how well you were doing at Google three years later. And after five years, it disappeared entirely. So the answer is, yeah, there's there's an advantage at the start and it completely uh, gets competed away. So one last, well, I love your story about this. You, you were struggling at Stanford, and you were bored, and you went to read magazines, and now you're the publisher of Forbes magazine. I mean, how does that link together? <laughs> well, it does link. Thank you for asking that, because a friend of mine and I had the opportunity to start what became Silicon Valley's first business magazine, and the technology, the disruptive technology of the day was a Macintosh and desktop publishing. But we did it, and it was a blank slate, and I had the idea that business magazines were boring, that they needed to be have the, the bounce in their step and the cheek and the willingness to be funny and punch people in the face like a good sports magazine. And so I created Upside Magazine, as it was called, after Sports Illustrated, except it was about Silicon Valley business. It was a big hit. Steve Forbes caught Steve Forbes' attention, and he hired me. And so this is how I went from being a security guard to – 10 years later, reporting directly to Steve Forbes. Congratulations. That's a great story. Congrats. That's a, great That's a story. fantastic story. <laughs> I, but, I, I, oh, but, it, but you naturally gravitated towards magazines. Would you say that's part of intuition or divine intervention or what? I just like sports. I like the great writing. I, I liked, uh, uh, there may have been divine intervention. My dad was a high school athletic director, so um, we grew up in a in a home that was full of Sports. As far as I was concerned, growing up in North Dakota, you know, I, ne- I never had any I, uh, interest in business because I thought the local, I thought business people were people who managed the local J.C. Pennies. You know, <laughs> I had no idea about how business is really, you know, competitive, creative, to bring out the best in you. You know, right. would would expose you to risk in a good way. I had none of that idea, but I knew it existed in sports, and so my whole orientation was sports. Uh, oddly enough, until I created a business magazine. You know, I, my my favorite magazine was Playboy, but that never translated for some reason. <laughs> well, I know you like the. I know you read it for the interviews, right? I did. I, did. <laughs> I do have. I do have one final question, Rich, and and because yep. we talk, you talk. We talked earlier about this this crippling fear of failure. Uh, kids don't they have a fear of being evaluated. Yet the internet and all the digital world is evaluate. Everybody's comparing each other to each other and. Uh, we have a daughter, a friend's daughter who was 17. She had an ulcer, and she's always trying to keep up with everybody. How, what do you, how do you, how do you make that shift from this fear of failure and being evaluated and judged to being a regular human being? Well, I think it's hard to change. I think it's hard to change because of schools' belief that we have to have great test scores and great um, grades uh, in order for to create kids who are going to prosper in a technology-driven economy. You add in the pressure of social media where everybody makes the mistake of comparing their insides to other people's curated outsides. And this is why parents need to get involved and need to really love their kids um, and love them unconditionally so that they can listen and they can find out by listening what the kid is really interested in and what the kid might really be good at. That's the- I think that that's the mistake is made is that parents are – living in a state of fear, and they outsource all of these critical yep. issues to school, to counselors, to you know, psychologists, et cetera. That's the Great best point. advice at all because yes. as I, you know, my uh, rich, story of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, my poor dad was the head of education for the state of Hawaii. He also attended Stanford, his PhD. But when I flunked out of high school, um, my father just fired the teacher in front of everybody. And all of a sudden, they left me alone after that for some reason. <laughs> but my dad was always on my side, no matter how F, you know, screwed up I was. I think that's the best advice you can give. So thank you for that. Once again, I want th- thank you, Rich. I'd like to have you back on because this is a very hot subject, very, very important subject. Because what is more important than education? I don't, I don't know of much. 
So anyway, thank you for writing your book, Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. Thank you. I think this should well, be thank a... Thank you so much, Robert and Kim. Oh, thank you. I think your book, Late Bloomers, should be a Bible for parents and teachers and and kids and, and anybody that was told they were stupid and came out of school believing they were stupid. This is a very May valuable book. May I quote you? I'm going to ask the two of you to write the forward for the paperback version. Oh, so. we'd be honored. <laughs> <I'd> be honored. <laughs> we'd be honored. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an honor. It would really be an honor. So, Rich, thank you very thank much. Thank you for your gift. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank All right, take care. And we come back. we okay. become the most popular part of our program, Ask Robert. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Day Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Special thanks to Rich Carlgaard, K-A-R-L-G-A-A-R-D. He's the author of Late Bloomers, The Power of Patience in a World Obsessed with Early Achievement. And his website is richcarlgaard.com, one set of words, R-I-C-H-K-A-R-L-G-A-A-R-D. Please get his book. It is a fabulous book. And once again, you can listen to the Rich Chat Radio program anywhere on iTunes or Android. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive it because repetition is how we learn best. Listen to this program again, but most importantly, have friends, family, or business associates listen to us and discuss it. Because as much as I dump on education, Rich Dad is an education company. And I think education is the most important attribute of uh, somebody should seek, right, Kim? Yeah, absolutely. It just depends on what kind of education. And just as Rich is saying, find out what the kids are interested in, find out what you're interested in, and then yeah. seek the education to that. So anyway, he's, I, I like it. Ray, love, 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 love this book. So, you know, one of the... One of, Melissa, what did you think of the book? Robert, I thought it was one of the best books that I've ever read. As you know, we do yeah. we do a lot of research here for the show. Right. We, see, we see a lot of business books, and I really must say, I thought Rich's book uh, was by far one of the best. I think, his, I think his message is very, very critical, really, yeah. for everyone. Yeah, fantastic. The, the hardest thing for me was I was always labeled stupid. Now, the good news was... The more they labeled me stupid, the more inspired I got to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. So it actually worked in reverse. But I also saw other kids got labeled stupid, and they believed it. Yeah, when they believe it, that's that's dangerous. Yeah. And it's it's just a try. You break that child's spirit, the desire to learn, because you know he talked about AD, whatever age day is. It's called acute boredom. Why do they hire the most boring teach people in the world to be teachers? I just don't understand that. They're just boring people. They, they couldn't make it in real life, so they become teachers. Oh, God, I hated it. Anyway. Well, and I think when we talked about this at the break with Rich, one of the, one of the keys and one of the trade-offs that's happened is trade, you know, they're, everybody's so driven to get that A and to get into the right school and they're they're scheduled every single minute of the day and they've traded this drive for early success and they've given up curiosity, they've given up creativity, they've given up discovery. These kids don't discover and they're not curious because they're told you have to do this, 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 this. I think that's a crime. Another thing too is I, I see these parents driving their little precious darlings from this event, yeah. piano lessons, golf lessons, soccer lessons. Give them a bike. Tell them <laughs> yeah. to ride. You know, yeah. <laughs> tell them work for the money. I mean, they just spoil us a little. Just spoil them rotten. Anyway, I'm just jealous because I got nothing. <laughs> anyway, so you can submit your questions to Ask Robert at richdadradio.com. Melissa, what's the question? Our first question today comes from Brianna in Salt Lake City. Favorite book, Rich Woman. Thank you, Brianna. So, our, so our question is this. My husband and I are trying to give our kids some base financial education. We see the differences in how they each learn and handle money. Do you have any suggestions on what steps we should take to continue their education so they will find learning about money fun? Well, I hope you have a cash flow board game because the cash flow board game is the best teaching tool, much better than a boring old school teacher because you know cash flow involves your brain your emotions, because you hate losing. You have to physically do something, and it inspires your spirit, because you know losing is a wonderful thing if it inspires you to win. But so many kids, like like, like uh, Rich said, they're brittle. They have no resilience to them. They, they just want everything handed to them. What a pack of losers, man, what a pack of losers. So that's why he talks about uh, the guy Vance and the hillbilly eulogy, Marine Corps, strap them up. Send the kid to the Marine Corps. But the most important thing is have fun. That's why 
I still play Monopoly. My rich dad just started playing Monopoly with me. The other thing he did, he then took me to his, you know, four greenhouses, Red Hotel. He took me to his greenhouses. I went, holy moly, that it was more than just a board game. So if if you're, I don't, I'm not saying it has to be real estate, but if it's stocks, you know, you look at the guy Ray Dalio, of Bridgewater, the biggest hedge fund in the world. He started buying stocks at a young age, same as Warren Buffett. You want to do it when the brain is still malleable and pliable. So take the child, you know, go look at real estate. Donald Trump had to go collect rent. He had his boys collect rent. He said, you want, you want adventures and psycho psychosis? Go collect rent. You'll hear more BS than you ever had before. I remember when I had to go knock on a door to collect rent. It's terrifying. Get this adult and they're lying to you and telling you these sob stories. I tell you, that's real education. So this stuff you learn in school, in my opinion, waste of time. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, well, um, we know that the two best ways to learn is the best way to learn is to go out there and do the real thing. So like you're saying, you know, go buy a couple shares of stock of something and watch it and let or the kids learn. Gold. Go buy a silver one ounce coin. Um, the other great way to learn is through simulations and games. So by playing the cash flow game, I mean, you and I created this game because we wanted education to be fun. We wanted learning about money to be fun and play it with your kids. It opens up discussion. Um, it changes the way you think about money. So going out there playing games and then going out in the real world and doing it, exactly the best ways to learn. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you're interested in it, but if you make school boring or your home, home boring, like a lot of these tiger moms do, these Asian women do with their kids, oh my God, if I went from boring school teacher to boring mom, oh my God, <laughs> you know, I would, I would just be on drugs immediately just to ease the pain. Thank God my mother was a little bit more tolerant of me. My father was a great guy, you know. Every time I was flunking out, he says, oh, well, <laughs> so what? He didn't care. And he was the head of education. He had no ego in that. And that's what kind of inspired me. And that's like what Rich said. He went and read magazines. My only A subject in school was wood shop. So I built, all kids were building salad bowls for mom. You know, I built an eight foot sailboat and I was sitting out on, on the water with my sailboat. And that took me to the United States Merchant Marine Academy, number one sailing school in America. And I went off to see one of the greatest schools there is. So I learned by doing, and if not for a wood shop, you know, the only A I got, I would never have gone to college. So there's so many things that a child will tell you they're interested in versus what the school teacher thinks the kids should learn. Which is also goes to the point of if you're teaching your kids about money, what about the subject are they interested in? Because if they're not interested, you gotta find a way to get them interested versus through what hobbies they like or what they focus their attention on. Yeah, and then look at my relationship with Kim. You know, like she's hot, sexy, got great looking. But there's a lot of hot, sexy, great looking women. But when I met her, you know, she was in network marketing. She was setting up her, her little goofy Skin care stands at this. I'm the, going at the fitness clubs, and here she is. She's a college graduate, you know, but she's still selling network marketing to learn how to sell and actually do stuff. And I said, I like this. She's got ambition and all that. And then, as I got more excited about her, she says, "This might be a keeper." And she didn't think I was a keeper, but yeah. So my first gift to you was what? An accounting course. Yeah, I wanted to make sure she knew assets from liabilities. Because you, you look at what most couples fight about, it's money. But it wasn't a boring accounting course. No, it, was it was a fine. very interactive, we played games. It was, it was not in the school system. It was outside the school system, and it was fun. And it really did invigorate my love of learning. Because yeah. I came out of school not wanting to sit in another classroom for the rest of my life. And you're a business major. Yep, I was a business major. So that's why the Rich Dad Company, you know, is we really do not want to be a boring school that you have to take Ritalin to sit and play around. That's just not worth it. Other thing that uh, Rich said, you know, if you're older, join a different group. You know, one of the best things you can do is not hang out with the same people. And the reason I got into education was I used to take seminars. You know, Kim and I take seminars once or twice a year. And I just started hanging out in the seminar space. I used to assist, move tables, you know, drink coffee with people and talk to different people who are excited about learning. And there's nothing more horrible than a person who has stopped 
learning, right, Kim? Absolutely. They, as a matter of fact, our friend was writing a book and went around the around the U.S. interviewing people that had retired and looking at their keys to success. And he came back and he said, I've made one decision. I'm going to talk to older people about who were successful, but if they have retired, I'm not going to talk to them because it's boring. <laughs> they have nothing to talk about. Yeah, it's the boring. Brain, the brain atrophies just yeah, like your body it atrophies. Does. It does. You're not exercising it. So, you know, just find, you know, like every year I go on the real estate guy's cruise. I get to hang out with all these people interested in real estate. To me, that's heaven. Or other people are, the other the other passengers are feeding their addiction called the buffet and the bar. And they're sucking down all this stuff. Man, there are some, you don't need to look for whales in the ocean. A lot of whales as passengers out there. You know, I'm going, holy mackerel. They just sit there, eat and drink all day. I'm going, holy mackerel. And they wonder what we're doing. And we're studying from seven o'clock at morning till two o'clock in the morning because we just love learning. And I think that's really the issue. If if your if your life is stagnated and stalled, maybe you should start learning something new. So once again, thank Rich Carlgard again. His book is called Late Bloomers. His website is Rich Carlgard, K A R L G A A R D dot com, and you can submit your questions to Ask Robert at Rich Dad Radio. And thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio program.